Okay, let's get started with the first lecture here. Today we're going to cover basic light interactions and ray optics. And I encourage you to, uh, to cover the slides again before you come into lab. It'll help you out throughout the lab. Photo to get us started here is we have a wine glass here filled with water, the Eiffel Tower in the background. And by the time we finish this first lecture in lab, you'll be able to understand why in the world the Eiffel Tower is actually inverted in this case. So, before we can really go too far in this lab, we really have to understand what is light. And so let's begin with a basic understanding of light and how it interacts with various materials. Now, to do this, we could gain an understanding at several levels ranging from a bulk ob object like a prism, or go all the way down to individual atoms interacting with single photons of light. So I want to take you all the way down to that atomic level at some point, so that when you have a glass prism, you'll be able to visualize in that glass prism why it's bending the light the way it is. In this course, we're going to limit our understanding to the types of basic interactions, refraction, diffraction, etc., and basic optical parameters, refractive index dispersion, that engineers would utilize in applied optical systems. So if I can get you to master these and really understand them down to a materials basis, then you're completely solid for doing optical engineering in the future. Now, if you look at light you can, and optical systems, you can interpret it several ways. The easiest is ray optics, and then you can go to a deeper level which predicts more of it, wave optics, electromagnetic, all the way down to quantum optics. In this course, we're going to spend most of our time in ray optics, which is this, like this here, where here's my uh, rays of light, and they bend and are focused by a lens. And we'll also spend a substantial time, uh, amount of time doing wave optics like this, where I treat the light as a wave, and it, it focuses the wave down. We'll get to more of that later. Okay? Today, we're also going to do a little bit of electromagnetic optics as well, but we'll spend most of our time with ray and wave optics, and you'll get more familiar with those as we go. So what is light? Well, light is, you could, it's electromagnetic radiation, you could call it a photon. It is essentially an elementary particle with near zero mass that travels forward. And if you look at a single photon of light, it would look like this. Here I'm plotting electric field and magnetic field versus distance here. It's propagating in this direction here, okay? And my electric field is sinusoidal, and my magnetic field is perpendicular to that and in phase partly here, and sinusoidal as well. And all it is is basically an electromagnetic disturbance. You'll see more of that in a second when I tell you how the photon is created. Now, if you want to predict the frequency of light, it's the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Okay, so 3e e to the 8 meters per second divided by the wavelength. And if you want to predict the energy of a photon of light, you can calculate it as follows. A simple thing I remember is that if you plug everything in, it's 1240 divided by the wavelength of light in nanometers. And so look at the visible spectrum here, okay? If I look at the visible spectrum, my longer wavelength lights that are out here in the red that I could create with this kind of semiconductor, for example, would have an energy of 2.0 electron volts. If I go to shorter wavelengths of light, so I'm going shorter to wavelengths down to the blue, then I'm dividing by a smaller number, which means my energy will be greater, and you can see that. My energy from my photons are greater. We typically measure the energy, the units for this, are in electron volts. That's a semiconductor term, but that's typically how you measure light, even if you're not dealing with semiconductors as well. And one electron volt, it's the amount of energy that you would get if you took one electron and you accelerated it through one volt of electron, electric field. So it's just a unit that you can use. It's a very small amount of energy because you know an electron doesn't have a whole lot of uh, charge, uh, charge associated with it. Now, if we talk about light in the visible spectrum, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we're only looking at a tiny, tiny sliver right here, okay, where we go from the visible to the ultraviolet here and the infrared. So most of this lab will stay in this regime and most of the time will be in the visible. You can go further out to longer wavelengths where you get to microwave, radio waves, things like that. And of course, if you go to shorter wavelengths, you run into X-ray and gamma ray. And I'll talk more about these as we move through the course. But right now, let me ask you something. Why are gamma and X-rays harmful and UVs harmful, but you can stick a cell phone, which has wavelengths out here, right next to your head, even with a decent amount of power, and you don't worry about hurting you? Why are these wavelengths harmful, whereas... 
microwave, which is essentially how a cell phone communicates, not an issue whatsoever. You put it right next to your head, you don't worry about it. But when you go out in the UV and the sunlight, you worry about getting sunburn. Well, the reason why is that these are shorter wavelengths, right? And so they have a higher energy, and eventually, when you get down to the ultraviolet, the photons of light have enough energy that they could actually go inside and rearrange your DNA. So though if you look at the bond strengths that hold your DNA together, it's about a couple of electron volts, okay? So when you get to four or five electron volts down here into the ultraviolet, you have enough energy where it could change your DNA. And that's harmful because if you change your DNA in your cells, it could turn some of those cells into cancer, essentially. And so that's where cancerous cells arise from, is something happens chemically or sometimes light that rearranges your DNA. So that's just a little bit of primer on what types of light are harmful and why we don't worry about sticking cell phones next to our head because cell phones, the photons have very low energy because we're orders of magnitude greater in wavelength and orders of magnitude less in the energy of the photons. Now, further to build on this, okay, this electromagnetic spectrum concept, this course deals with optics and photonics. We do not deal with electronics, which means microwave and millimeter wave, those longer wavelengths. But I want to emphasize you to what you're learning here is important because radiation is radiation, and everything I teach you here applies to all wavelengths. And so in this lab, we're going to have visible light or, you know, around infrared, the UV, okay? And you're going to use mirrors and prisms and things like that. But everything I'm teaching you can be applied even if you were using with a microwave system. And so here's a microwave experimental setup. And you have, you have things like polarizers. You have prisms to refract. You have diffraction gratings. Everything I teach you here applies to those other wavelengths. The only primary difference is you can't see them and some of the materials parameters changes. And so what I'm enabling you to do this in this course is not only be good with visible optics, but apply that to any other range of the electromagnetic spectrum you choose, because the laws are fundamentally the same. Now, looking at a photon in a little bit more detail here, if you want to predict the electric field, you have a maximum for the electric field and a maximum for the magnetic field times this sinusoidal varying component here. So here's my electric field, it's varying sinusoidally. There's two ways you can interpret the wave equation here. Okay, if I'm measuring electric field, it's this way, or here's my magnetic field in this direction. So the one way to interpret this is to say, well, I'm going to freeze a photon in time. So I'm not going to let time vary. So I can get rid of this term, and I'm just left with sine of kx here, where k is the angular wave number calculated as 2 pi over lambda. Okay? And it makes sense because the units here, you've got wave, you've got distance here in the, down in the, uh, the denominator, which makes sense because I have, with x, distance in the numerator, and those units cancel out, so I don't have units inside my trig function, right? So I needed that to happen anyway. But anyway, if I basically get rid of the time varying, I freeze this in time, and I get rid of the time varying component, which I've done here, I froze the photon, then I can see that as I change distance x in this direction, okay, so this would be my x-axis, that I've got a sinusoidal variation. The other way you could do this is you could freeze your position in x, but observe it with time. And so this photon is always moving forward. It's not, it's, you know, this is if you freeze it in time, but it's actually propagating forward. So if I looked at a photon and I froze my position x, so the photon, let's say, it's coming, and I have it coming in this direction, okay? And I froze my position x, and I look what happened over time as the photon went through. If I measured the E field, as this goes through, I would see it go up and down. It would vary sinusoidally as well. And so the wave equation has that as well in there. If I freeze x and I get rid of this term, then it still sinusoidally varies with time, where omega is my angular frequency, 2 pi r f, okay? So I've got 1 over seconds, again, gets me uh, unit neutral inside the, uh, inside the trig function, okay? There's some nice videos of this if you want to see these electric and magnetic fields propagating forward. Um, there's some videos you can get on Wikipedia. Just Google electromagnetic radiation and pick the Wikipedia link and you'll see these videos in there, okay? The key point is that this is just a quantized electromagnetic disturbance. If you go back to electromagnetic fields, 
You probably remember that we said they said that if you have a time varying E field, that gives you a time varying magnetic field, right? That's all this is, is that I create an electric field, but we, when, when we know when we have a time varying electric field, that creates a magnetic field, right? And so all it is is a disturbance that basically keeps itself going because the time varying magnetic field feeds into the E field, the E field feeds into the magnetic field. It's just a disturbance, nothing more. Now, that will start to make sense if we look at how a photon is created, and we'll come back to a really simple concept of current driven by electric field generating magnetic fields. So remember when we have a simple wire, and we apply the right-hand rule that if current's going in this direction, the magnetic field is in this direction, right? Really simple stuff. Well, how can we use this to understand how we create this photon, which is an electromagnetic disturbance? Let's start with a really simple antenna. For, this is an example for 10 gigahertz or microwave range, okay? And try to understand how a photon's emitted. So here's my simple antenna. Here's my dipole here. It's called a dipole antenna because it's got two poles. And I'm going to hook up to it a 10 gigahertz sinusoidal source here, okay? And by the way, I'm going to, you know, you're going to actually have this design, the length of this design to match up to the frequency if you design the antenna correctly, okay? The length of the wires. So let's start at time t equals zero, and I'll have my sinusoidal voltage such that there's no voltage applied. So if I have no voltage applied to the wires, I have no E field, and if I have no voltage applied, then there's no current. So if there's no current, then there's no magnetic field. Now, let's look at the first um, quarter of the time period of a full wavelength. So we'll look at, at a quarter, half, three quarters, and then full wave, okay, of creating a photon. Well, in this case here, what the, the voltage source has done is it's starting to oscillate sinusoidally, like we would expect it to, okay? And I'm generating electric field in this way by having positive charge here and negative charge here. Electric field goes from positive to negative, right? So now I've got my electric field appearing. And so it's starting to feed out in this direction this photon. It's starting to propagate. Now, to build up this charge, if I want to create positive charge here, I have to flow current in this direction, right? I have to flow current this way through these wires. Well, current, using right-hand rule, going down like this, would be magnetic field in this direction where it's coming towards me right here. And so on the previous page where we drew a photon and we had electric field going this way and the magnetic field coming out towards us and the electric field was up, you can see that starting right here. Now we'll go to a half half of the wavelength, okay? Again, the electric field goes to zero. Voltage goes to zero. If I have no electric field here, there's no current flow, right? And so there's no magnetic field either. So both the E field and the magnetic field go to zero, just like they did on the previous slide as well. Then what's going to happen is the system's going to start to reverse, going to the negative portion of the sinusoid, where I have electric field in this direction, from positive charge to negative, if I have electric field in this direction, I need to build up a positive charge here, which means I flow current in this direction. And just like I had here, if I flow current up, magnetic field this way, flow current up, magnetic field into the plane, and now I've got my magnetic field that was pointing out now pointing away from me if I'm observing it from this direction here. And so then, of course, you can go to the full wave where everything returns to zero. And so, again, all you're doing is moving charge and creating an electromagnetic disper disturbance that feeds upon itself because, as you know in EM fields, a time-varying E field creates a time-varying magnetic field. Time-varying magnetic field creates a time-varying E field. It just keeps propagating. So, you can keep this going and you'll keep this wave going out there. So, question, why do you think the first mass broadcasts ever done were AM radio at around 200 kilohertz? Well, the reason is, is back then, you went to these really long wavelengths and low frequencies because you needed a sinusoidal electronic source and they didn't have really high ones, so they couldn't do microwave. There was no gigahertz frequency sinusoidal voltage sources back then. And so some of the earliest electronic communications used low frequencies just because they could build the low frequency electronics to drive them. The other thing nice about that is low, uh, lower, frequency, lower frequencies, longer wavelengths, easier to make the antennas. So it was simple to make the antennas because they were big. Now, in this course, we're going to deal with visible photons, but it's not all that different. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail because we're going to cover this in week, I think it's week nine. 
But basically, if I want to create a visible photon, I have the same thing. In this case, it's a semiconductor LED. And if you look inside a semiconductor, you've got a conduction band, valence band. Not going to go into a ton of detail in case some of you haven't had semiconductor, a semiconductor's background. But in the semiconductor, you have charge that moves. And so a photon is emitted in a semiconductor fundamentally when you have a charge move. And when the charge moves to recombine, and I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying this, but it does the same thing. You get a time-varying electric field that creates a time-varying magnetic field, and a visible photon comes out. Okay? Other common sources where you're fundamentally moving a charge between energy some kind of, and giving up energy would be an example in an atomic transition. So if I look at a hydrogen atom, here's the nucleus, here's the first energy level, second energy level, and as you go further out, the energy decreases. And so if I have an electron out here, and it transitions from this energy level to this energy level, basically I'm moving charge, right? And more importantly, when it goes from high energy to low energy, it's got to give its energy up, right? Because this is a higher energy orbit. And so when it does that, it creates a visible photon. So if you look at hydrogen, this is a, a um, spectrograph graph here of the various energy level transitions you could have for all the energy levels in hydrogen and by exciting hydrogen. And here's a bunch of other atoms as well. So how do you excite these things in a higher energy? Well, that's how our neon laser source works in this lab. It's a, ne it's a helium neon laser. And how you excite is the same way that the fluorescent lights work in the, uh, in the lab room and a lot of other places. You basically apply a really high voltage across a gas with a special atom like this in there and it breaks it down like a lightning bolt, turns it into a plasma, which is a really high energy gas where it's ionized, and there's enough energy bouncing around in there that it excites the atoms and they start to emit these lines of light. And so our, ne our neon laser act must, of course, be in the red somewhere because we're using red lasers. And Look at the emission for neon here. Look at all that emission out in the red. That's why it works so well in the red. Well, at this point, that's enough probably. Let's take a break. Um, and you should be able to answer these questions. These are the type of things that will show up on the quiz. And then we'll get on to part two in a second.